Hi everyone, it's MJ and in this video I want to talk about NFTs and the reason being is I woke up this morning to get an email from SuperRare confirming that I had just sold my 100th NFT that I've minted through their platform. So of course a little bit of a celebration but in a good mood so I thought why not make a YouTube video where we discuss what exactly is NFTs and yeah, what is, what is their potential future? But I guess let's maybe take a step back and very quickly uh, cover the, the history, or well, especially my history with NFTs. For those of you who've been subscribed to this channel for, for a while, you'll see that it was towards the end of 2017 that I was making videos on crypto kittens. And that was kind of like the very first introduction I got to, to NFTs. I mean, there were crypto punks, which I think is, even earlier than crypto kittens, which I unfortunately didn't get into because those things are now trading at astronomical values. I think, I don't know, you can Google them, but I think like some of the prices are in like a million dollars for, for some of those NFTs. Um, absolutely crazy. And the weird thing is, is I kind of remember after the, the 2018 crash that we, we had with Bitcoin, like reflecting on it and saying, you know, why didn't I see this coming? The fact that we were spending so much money on virtual kittens, you know, this was a sign that we were in a bubble and gosh, I should have, that, you know, the writing was on the wall. Why didn't I, I tap out? And of course, we sold a lot of the kittens and 2019 started getting slowly back into crypto kittens and all these kind of things. But I kind of put NFTs, I guess, to, to the side. And then it was, it was basically because of COVID that I started getting back into NFTs. And the reason being is I wanted to be an artist. I wanted to be an artist while I was studying for these actuarial exams. Um, I listen better when I'm doodling or drawing or doing things. And because actuarial science, there's quite a lot of lessons, quite a lot of lectures that we have to go through, I had quite a considerable amount of time um, sitting and having to do something while, while I listened to all of this. So I started drawing, started doodling, started messing around with, with art applications. And my art, I mean, it's, it's nothing great, but it's, it's decent. And I would, you know, I thought, how cool would it be if I put it in, in a bunch of galleries? So I called up a bunch of galleries and uh, a lot of them were like, nope, 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 nope. But um, I went to an all boys school and whenever we would go to these socials, you'd try to talk to girls. So I was, I was used to being told, nope, 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 you know, we, we're not interested. And I thought, you know what, rejection is something that, that I've learned to cope with, where I think a lot of people, once they hear no, 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 uh, specifically in the art world, they think, okay, my art's not good enough and, and they just give up. But kept uh, going to different different galleries and eventually some would say, okay, cool, you can have a, a bit of an exhibition with us. So in Cape Town, we have this thing called First Thursdays and I was able to do one of these every single year. So I think starting out 2016, um, 2017, 2018, 2019, I had an art exhibition every single year. And I moved from just being like in the city for First Thursdays to some of the more established galleries out in out in the winelands so i was slowly building myself up as an artist had a bit of an instagram account but all in all in these four years i only sold four pieces and that's why to have sold my hundredth piece now in, with super rare which i've been on for less than a year makes me think wait something something's up because if anything my artistic ability has probably declined because I'm not you know listening to as many lectures as I was back then because now that I'm done with the actual exams um, it's kind of like wait if my art's getting a little bit worse but the sales are going up let's let's explore this but yeah that's essentially what what kind of happened is 2020 we've got COVID I can't do a, a gallery exhibition so I remember when we were fooling around with NFTs back in the day that you know people were talking about an art use case and we, we had looked at like ascribe.io which is now a defunct website where we had tried to put one or two pieces on it but nothing really materialized from it. So 
I saw there was this website called Super Rare. They were getting quite a lot of traction, a lot of volume um, through their smart contract. And I was like, let me let me do it. So submitted the, the application form. So they wanted a video. I had to have a phone call. Of course, in the phone call, they're like, oh, you look like Ed Sheeran. I was like, yeah, that's the first time I've heard that. But anyway, lo- long story short, I eventually got onto to this platform and I started releasing quite a bit of my art. And I think the first piece sold for like $287 and it was like, what on earth just happened? I just sold a JPEG effectively for like $287, which in South African currency is a significant amount. And I mean, I would go through this process where I'd be selling these pieces and it became like quite an emotional roller coaster. It was like, it was like, I don't know, a shot of adrenaline, dopamine, all of these things rocked up in one when people started bidding on your on your pieces. So a bit of a roller coaster ride, you got a little bit upset if no one bid it on the next piece and all these kind of things. But it was kind of like around this, this was what, June, well, it was like July, September, that kind of region when I just sold my, my 10th one. And I wrote an article for the Actuarial Magazine. And basically that article was saying, well, is NFTs, or can this be considered as, as art? And the conclusion of that article was yes, that this, this is art. But the reason why I had to write that article is because I'd kind of been conditioned from a very early age. And I think a lot of us, especially a lot of us who, who aren't really grasping or embracing NFTs is because we've kind of been you know, conditioned that art is something that belongs on a canvas. You know, if it's not on a canvas, then it's not art and it it has to be that special you know fabric canvas because a lot of the the times when i was trying to get my art out there they would like well you know you're not printing on canvas i was printing on on perspex on wood on metal you know just on different types of of mediums things that kind of complemented the the image i was doing so if it was you know a lady by the sea it was uh, printed on wood if it was like a, a wisdom machine and very mechanical it was printed on on like a metal um, people didn't like that. They didn't like the fact that I was printing on different uh, mediums. And so I can, I can see why a lot of people are against NFTs. The fact that it's, it's got a digital canvas. Because, like I say, we, we were kind of conditioned as, as children or we've been taught that art is something that's on a canvas. But when you think about the history of art, it's, I mean, the canvas was a, wasn't, it's not like, oh, as soon as we had canvas, then we had art. We look at cave paintings. I mean, majority of the very, very early art was was done on on walls, cave paintings, or we would do sculptures, or these kind of things. The canvas was fairly modern. It was this whole thing of like, wow, you know, we can now paint a picture and we can now move it. So the canvas was a big technology in the sense that it allowed for art to be moved around and it it eased the logistic burden. We're going to see the NFTs, I mean, it helps that ten, tenfold. But you probably find back in the day, the first few artists who were painting on canvas, they were probably looked down upon. You know, everyone was like, oh, this isn't real art. What, you, you're not painting it on a wall? You know, if it's not stone, if it's not there, um, you know, canvases, oh, they can get lost. And oh, canvas can get stolen. And oh, you know, canvas can get damaged. Uh, you know, all these kind of things. Or a canvas can be copied. Uh, you know, all these things probably people sort of saying and why canvas is, is wrong. But fast forward since Canvas has been created, and it's almost like now if an art piece isn't created on Canvas, it's like, oh, it's not, it's not art. So a lot of that article was dealing with how art is more about the idea. It's a transcendent you know, concept. It's, it's not bound by its physical um, structure. So art can be, like let's say that banana that they just put duct tape on. You know, it, it shows how crazy society has become and, you know, it was celebrated and all that kind of stuff. And yes, a banana and duct tape are two easy materials and in of themselves, they're not worth much. But th- the way it was presented and the risk that that artist took in saying that this is, you know, th- there's a lot of beauty in that. And that's why that piece sold for a considerable amount of, of money. So slowly in like very you know, I guess in high contemporary art, we are seeing a move away from canvas. But for a lot of us, we're still thinking very traditionally that art has to be on a canvas. 
So that first, like I say, first article was, or I guess even for myself, was to try, like, like I thought, I had to print my things on Perspex, hang it on a wall, you know, as a decoration and being like, okay, now it's, now it's art. Whereas NFTs made me start questioning what exactly is art. And once you can overcome the realization that art, like I say, isn't bounded by the physical structure, but is more of this idea that helps to communicate, bring people together, and has all these other weird and wonderful social benefits, you begin to accept that art can live on the blockchain and it can live within its JPEG format. What makes the blockchain interesting is how it ties ownership. It allows for a owner to, to say, this is mine. And I think that's very important because you've got the creator who makes the art piece. Normally they would sign their piece. Now with the blockchain, you know, with your specific hash, you don't no longer have to do that. And now owners can embed their part, uh, embed their, their hash and belong to that whole story and the narrative of that art piece. And you can think about like how valuable would it be just to say that you've owned the Mona Lisa. I mean, simply to buy it and then resell it, um, there's quite a lot of value you know, just from a bragging right, just say, hey, I'm part of part of this narrative. So we see that quite a lot with NFTs. We see people buying them and flipping them straight away just because they want to be part of the ownership history. And I mean, I had someone buy one of my pieces for $1,000, literally the same day resell it at $2,000. And people are like, oh, but you know, you then sold it too low. And it's like, not necessarily, because there's a weird thing that happens when somebody buys an NFT. When someone buys an NFT, they've validated it. They've made it like, oh, this is something that is collectible. This is one of the valuable ones. Because there's lots of NFTs out there. Just how there's lots and lots of canvases out there. And there's only a very small proportion that are, are worth significant amounts. And just by having someone purchase an NFT, then uh, it tells the rest of the market, hey, this piece has been validated. And so people can sell it on for a much higher amount. And I think... A lot of the early collectors figured this out and that's why they were able to buy NFTs and then resell them straight away and actually make a little bit of profit. And of course, whenever you've got collectors making money, artists making money, it's going to attract a lot of people into the space. So it's interesting also to look at how the trading dynamics work because you also you think as an artist, oh no, I could have sold it for $2,000 and it's like mm -mm. only once the art piece has been sold then its value will, will increase along with it. So, like I say, there, there's a very interesting psychology that goes behind NFTs and also with our whole understanding of, of what is art. But I mean, if we were to compare NFTs to traditional art, and this is something where I'm very grateful for the experience of going to galleries and you know having these exhibitions and doing these things because it's not it's not, not this difficult it's just it's a bit of a pain okay transporting these canvases is a mission worrying that they're not going to get damaged finding enough space to put them in making sure that there's lighting and everything's good and you know printing little descriptions and having it next to it and then I remember I sold a piece through a gallery but I only found out like two weeks later that they had sold the piece and then there was a little bit of a tussle on how much they wanted to pay me for it and the agreement they were like no now they're short on cash and the delivery expense was a lot more than they thought and they wanted to take that out of my part of the the, the deal and it just became very very messy and just like a big pain in the yeah we're not going to mention that word but this is where nfts become fascinating is NFTs, you don't have to worry about them getting copied because you can see the artist's hash, hash thing. So a little bit of research can take away any of these potential counterfeits. Then it's so easy to move them around because if I want to send an NFT to you, we simply do a transaction on the blockchain and it's done. We don't have to wrap it up in bubbles. I mean, I sold one painting to, to America and had to put it in bubbles and then to try to get it to America, and then it's in customs. And that's why when I even had like a European buy one of my pieces, they, they, they saw it on the computer, they said, no, print it on paper so that they could roll it up and so that it could easily transport it. And I didn't really, because I mean, paper for me was probably the most inferior of all of the mediums, but you had to factor that into consideration when trying to get your art out there that, hey, there's these 
frictional costs of logistics and all that kind of stuff. NFTs take that away. And of course, when you start selling a lot of NFTs like, like I've been doing, you do get some of these galleries contacting you. They do want to meet for coffee. They do want to talk about it. And chatting to these galleries makes me think, wow, NFTs potentially have a bright future because I'm talking to some of these gallery owners and they're telling me about how 90% of their day is around the logistics of art, you know, trying to set this exhibition up, then moving these pieces here, then one gets lost and now there's a lot of money and then this and they need insurance. And it's like I say, it really becomes a pain and NFT technology removes that. It removes a lot of the frictional costs that you normally see when it comes to, to art. No longer does art have to be stored in these high secure vaults, especially I'm talking about like the really old ones to preserve their quality because once this thing's on the blockchain, it's pretty much secure. Another thing that started to dawn on me on why NFTs are so important, and I think we, we're gonna make another video on it, but I mean, it's kind of what this room's full, filled with at the moment, is you know good old uh, if Pokemon cards. I mean, you try and buy and sell Pokemon cards and you realize why NFTs are also doing so well because Pokemon cards, again, buyer wants to say buy some cards, they want to look at the quality. Is it damaged? Isn't it damaged? Then there's this whole trust game. Are they going to pay first or are you going to send the cards first? You know, NFT, there's a smart contract which does the two simultaneously and it removes the need for that. Uh, NFT, there's no issue of quality of these things because they can't get, get damaged. Also, with Pokemon cards, you're geographically restrained, okay? So I can only really trade with people in, in, in my country and even limited a little bit to, to some of the big cities where postage is not that expensive. But normally, like, oh yeah, with, with these Pokemon cards, if you want to buy a card from America, a lot of import duties, or you want to get some cards from Japan, there's, there's a lot of more, you know, friction costs. So it means the market that we're dealing with here in South Africa is very, very small. NFTs, you've got the world. You're basically participating in a market where their entire world is buying and selling. And for anyone who knows anything about markets, the more market participants, the more liquid things are, the more quicker and easier it is to sell. So art has traditionally been an asset class that is illiquid, very difficult to sell, high friction fees, you've got to pay an auctioner, you know, there's high commissions, all these kind of stuff. Suddenly, NFTs takes away a lot of that because, hey, you've got these things are constantly on sale, always open for, for someone to make a bid on them, and it's, it's a 24-7 art market. And, I mean, I look at Pokemon cards, and one of the big fun aspects of Pokemon is, is just the fact of trading, just buying low, selling high. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with, whether it's Pokemon cards, Bitcoin, uh, all these things, there, there is a lot of fun in just the act, uh, the activity of, of trading. And NFTs allow people to, to get that trading kick with weird and wonderful things. And there's so many weird and wonderful collectibles that are jumping up. So there's the art ones. I mean, I've even made that, that other project where we're making all those actuarial history videos and then each of the significant characters were turning into their own NFT. So, you know, there's the Sir Isaac Newton NFT. And I mean, these NFTs, they each contain a secret. The secret is a riddle. You solve the riddle and you get a word and that word is could potentially be a part of a seed phrase that allows you to get quite a lot of, of cryptocurrency. And I mean, I've been thinking about lots of other crazy NFT ideas. The one is basically, back with Pokemon, you get a lucky packet and inside the lucky packet, you have all these little components. And if you join the components or you craft them together, you can get pieces of, of a motor vehicle and then you can start assembling, you know, a, a motor vehicle and start combining these things to create an NFT. Or, and this, I did have this idea before, before COVID. I think with COVID now, it'd be a little bit in bad taste, but it was like crypto bacteria. So the idea is that you'd have a piece of bacteria and then you could mutate it or split it. And when it's split, it's split it in two different uh, bacteria. So it was like, oh, you're getting one is turning into two, but if that was a valuable bacteria, you've now lost that one because it has transformed into these others. And it's simply, you know, you have the smart contract, burn this one, mint these two, uh, and you know, the code isn't that, that difficult. But looking at all of these NFTs and the, the weird and wonderful ideas that we could potentially have, 
The most successful one has been art. Art seems to be the one that is leading the way in NFTs. It's the one that's attracting the most money because it's kind of like, well, I guess this is the thing, like, because we were in lockdown, you know, you spend a lot of time thinking about things. So one thing I did is, you know you're talking for too long when the GoPro runs out of battery. So let me maybe yeah start uh, start wrapping this whole thing up. But what I was saying before the GoPro died on me was that during the pandemic, during lockdown, I went and I got all of my mother's stamps that were down in storage. And I just kind of went through it and I was trying to get in like side the mind of of a collector. I was also watching a lot of videos on, on collectible watches, you know, Hublot, Rolex, Richard Mill, uh, Philippe Patik, all of these things, and trying to understand what makes something collectible. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of properties that something needs to have in order for it to become collectible. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do with my, my other NFT project, that I've listed on, on Rarible, with those actuarial icons, is trying to meet each of those criteria. And look, it has had a very slow start. I mean, we sold a few, but there's only been like around five people who've been buying like a couple of them. Um, and then gas fees went up and then it was like, oh, minting these things does get a little bit expensive. So NFTs is not perfect. You know, there's still a little bit other, well, yeah, other risks that you need to consider. For instance, gas fees can play a significant role because they're very volatile. One day it costs just a couple of dollars to mint one. The next day, it, or even sometimes in a couple of hours, it can change to be costing like a thousand, um, not a thousand dollars, a thousand rand, so like a hundred dollars to mint an NFT. So there is a lot of volatility on that side, and I am hoping that once gas prices come down, um, then I can actually finish that project and just release the, the rest of the NFTs. There's gonna be a hundred different ones in total, couple for each one, and basically make my own kind of trading card thing. And I think that's why I call this research, okay? I'm buying Minecraft trading cards, which I'm not gonna lie, they, they look really stupid. But I, I like Minecraft, so I did get one shiny one, a dolphin. But yeah, just buying things like Yu-Gi-Oh, um, these Premier League ones as well. This is kind of, even getting Japanese Pokemon cards, it's kind of just research, it's trying to kind of see what makes things collectible, what do people want, um, understanding, like I say, the psychological side of it, because NFTs have been a lot of fun. Um, they've been very rewarding for me. I mean, you can imagine selling a hundred of these things where, the, the I mean, the last 20 have been averaging around $700, $800 uh, an NFT. It's it's almost rivaling like the amount that I make doing actuarial consulting. And, and sometimes there's like a thought in my head that says, this is, this is so much easier than actuarial science. Like, why don't you just stop consulting altogether and focus all your, your attention on NFTs? And I am trying to resist that, that urge because I think it's good to be diversified with how you generate income. Um, so for, for anything, I wanna keep working at the actuarial stuff. It's still a little bit more than the NFTs. It does require a lot more, more effort though. Um, but I, I'm very thankful for this whole NFT thing. But one thing that I, that I am busy building at the moment, and um, it's a little bit early to maybe talk about it, but I kind of feel like if you've made it all this way to, the, to this part of the video, um, I'll let you guys in on, on what we're building. So essentially we're building an NFT platform that is going to allow NFTs to be exchanged at a 0% fee. Because now if you buy something on Super Rare, like let's say I sell a, an NFT on Super Rare, 18% goes to Super Rare. That very first sale, 18%. 15% gets hit on the, the seller, that's me, and 3% gets hit on, on the buyer. And then going forward, another 3% um, like just trading costs and sometimes they give the royalty back to the artist of another 10%. So that's still 13%, it's quite a high uh, fee. Rarible and OpenSeas, they're at 2.5% on each side of the buyer and seller. So in total, it's also around 5%. Now when these NFTs are trading for hundreds and thousands of dollars, 
5% of that amount is quite significant and it can eat into the profits of these NFT flippers. People who buy today and sell later that afternoon, um, having to deal with that 5% as well as dealing with the gas fees, it can kind of hurt whatever trading profits that you're hoping to make. So on our platform, we're going to have zero fees. Essentially, we're taking the smart contract and we're just, where it says, you know, take a fee and send to our address, we're just deleting that. I mean, it's not, not rocket science what we're doing. We're just removing that fee. So it's still gonna have the same security, the same mechanics of all these other smart contracts that allows for the seamless transaction of Ether for NFT, but now with 0% fee. Of course, we wanted to take it one step further. And we thought, instead of just being negative fees, Oh, I'm sorry, instead of just having no fees, what if we had negative fees? And by negative fees, I thought, what if we gave you some cryptocurrency every single time you took an NFT and you sold it through our smart contract? So you, you sell your NFT through our contract, not only do you get Ether in return for selling that NFT, but we will also give you our own native token. In fact, we won't be giving it to you, your action of exchanging it there will be some code, then this is the only way that our currency will be minted. It can only be minted when the smart contract goes. So the more people selling on our site, the more coins there's gonna be in circulation. Now you can take these coins and you can sell them on a decentralized exchange, or you can use them on the platform to promote your other NFTs. So if you've got some other NFTs, you sell one, you get some coins and you say, I can either sell this for Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever I want, or let me use these coins to promote my other NFTs and push them to the top of the listing. Because if you're on the home page of these NFT platforms, you're more likely to get a sale than not. And I kind of know this from going through Super Rare. Every time you change the price, you push your NFT to the top. So yes, it costs gas fees, but a little trick is to keep changing your price. Even if it means making it go higher, just the fact that you're now like, listed number one on the on the home page of course when other people start listing you start moving down so you have to do this regularly but just being at the top it means that you're more likely to have a sale from an actuarial point of view it's kind of like you're getting more exposure so the event that you want to happen is more likely to occur so that's what you can do with this token so by selling on our platform not only are there going to be zero percent fees we're not going to charge you or the person buying from you and that way they're going to probably get you a better price but we're gonna be giving you a token that is gonna behave just like any other ERC20 token. So you can sell it on decentralized exchanges, send it to friends, use it as a currency like anything else, but it also has this purpose that it can be used to promote NFT listings on our platform. Look, like I said, talking a little bit, little bit early, we're still in the demonstration phases, uh, we're still lining up investors, getting that whole thing ready, but I guess this is one of my moves that I want to do in the NFT space is been very successful selling them. Now I want to start building the infrastructure to assist with the whole trading and all these other things. But sure, like I said, the, the GoPro has already told me to, to shut up once by, by dying on its battery. So let me maybe wrap up this, this video by saying cheers. Um, if you've got any thoughts, any questions, any queries, uh, let me know down in the comment section below. And yeah, I guess also thank you to, to all the people who have purchased my NFTs. I sometimes chat to them on, on Twitter and I see that some of them are my actual uh, subscribers on this YouTube channel. So for those of you who have bought into the NFTs and have flipped them and made a little bit more and all that kind of stuff, I just want to say thank you so much. And yeah, I'll see you guys for another video where we'll probably talk about Pokemon. I mean, I think we need to talk about Pokemon. I mean, look at this. We've... We, we took a lot of the NFT money and we were buying Pokemon cards. So we'll talk about that in the next video. See you guys soon. Cheers.